Grab Life by the Goals is the podcast for passionate badasses to get inspired, activate their potential, and crush their goals. In a nutshell, we do big shit around here. Whether you're looking to disrupt your career, start or grow a business, or simply have a more kick-ass life, you're in the right place. Come to be inspired, find your swagger, dream bigger, and take actual steps to level up your life, all with a side of real talk and raunchy humor. I'm your host, Lauren Widrick. I'm a life and business coach, and I'm right here on the roller coaster with you. Are you ready? Let's do this. What's up, my badasses? Welcome back to this week's episode of the Grab Life by the Goals podcast. Today is going to be a blast because we're here with one of the genuinely most funny people I've ever met. Don Garrett is a comedian. He's my comedy coach. And Don, thank you so much for being here. We're going to crack everybody up today, I think. Hey, Lauren, thanks for having me, man. I really appreciate it. Thanks for having me on uh, Grab Life by the Goals. I've been been excited about this since we talked about it. So uh, thank you for having me. You know, not to get too like woo woo off the bat, but I think we came into each other's lives for a reason. I always I knew, I, not always, but maybe for the last five years or so, I knew I wanted to try stand up comedy, but I was too scared. Yeah. And we have a mutual connection who's Lauren Ansley. So shout out to Lauren. Shout out to Lauren Ansley. Yes, yes, indeed. Uh, she's amazing. I met her through business coaching and she has a comedy productions company. And mm-hmm. when I pinged her and was like, okay. It was in January, like New Year's resolution. Okay, I'm going to try my hand at this. She said, you have to meet Don. He is not only an amazing comedian, but he teaches people the craft. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for Lauren for the recommendation. I'm happy that she did because without that, Lauren, we would have never met. Isn't that crazy? This is like- Crazy how life works. I know, right? It's who, not how. Like, I cannot stress this enough. Anyone who listens to this podcast knows I've been talking about the squad and our networking group and how- Everything is better through the power of community and relationships. And that's what we're experiencing too. So of course. Don, tell the people about you. So tell us how you got into comedy. Like, where did this all start for you? Wow. So, oh man, such a loaded question. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so naturally I've, you know, just been, you know, I grew up in church, so I've never been afraid of crowds or, you know, speaking or reading or, you know, just being in front of people. And it got to a point where I actually really enjoyed uh, making people laugh as I still do, you know, to this day and things. So uh, fast forward, it's uh, Memorial Day of 2015. I'm originally from um, Virginia. And so we were at um, some of my friend's house in uh, Richmond. And I mean, we may or may not have had a lot of cups of sangria. I'm just saying. Mm -hmm. Um, So, (laughs) so um, had a lot of cups of sangria just in the kitchen cracking up. And they're like, hey, man, you need to go tell jokes at the Funny Bone, which is the comedy club in Richmond. Well, at the time, it was a soul comedy club. Now there's the, uh, the Sandman is there as well. So they were like, you need to go to the Funny Bone and tell jokes. And I'm like, I don't got no material. I can't do that. So about a few months later, I moved to Charlotte and I'm working in insurance at that time. And I had coworkers and a manager at the time that told me the same thing. You need to go try stand up. So uh, that night I called my mom. And I remember I was sitting in the floor right beside my couch and um, I told her, I was like, I think that I received a message in Virginia that I didn't listen to that I'm receiving again two years later. Um, And I said, I think I need to listen this time. And so I, uh, like you, took a comedy class. Um, June 26th will be five years of comedy and I have not looked back since. This has been the best thing, adventure, whatever for my life that I have ever embarked on. You are in the right place. You are so naturally gifted. And I have seen you on stage and I've seen you behind stage in the class with us, helping us workshop the jokes. You've got the performance skills and the writing skills and the heart skills, in my opinion. Like you taught us to get into our hearts. Like you've got all of it. That's what stand up is about. You you have to have it in your heart. You know, there are a lot of people that get into this and just feel like they can become Kevin Hart or, you know, like a Dave Chappelle um, overnight, you know it doesn't happen like that. And that's why I stress so much in class that this is more of a marathon than a sprint. You know, if you come into comedy expecting a sprint, you're going to burn out real fast. Um, So this is something that requires patience and it requires a lot of heart. You know, we talked about it extensively. Um, Let me just brag on you guys real quick as my class. When I tell you 
nine of the most gifted, naturally hilarious individuals I've ever met in my life. And to just have us all together in that one space, um, you know, I mean, I, of course, I believe in a higher power. I don't know about everybody else, but I really believe all of our paths were meant to cross. And when I tell you just the joy, just coming into class and I'm tired just from my regular things and coming in and seeing you guys and just coming in and you're cracking jokes and you're laughing and you're punching your jokes. Like you gave me so much energy. I don't think you guys realize what you did for me as really? the instructor. Yeah, seriously. Oh my seriously. gosh. Don, I had the same thought. I was like, is this normal? Like, I, I'll joke about this a little bit. I came in a little bit smug because I do some public speaking <laughs> for my job. And you guys, yeah. I ended up being like, like the worst one in the class in some ways. I'm like, is this normal to have nine people who are this funny, this good, who could craft sets, who could workshop each other's sets? I'm like, I think something special happened with this, with the 10 of us, really. Oh, it did. Yo, something special did happen. And that was evident from graduation. You guys killed it. The mm -hmm. audience absolutely, absolutely loved you. Every part of it. Um, we got our videos back now. So, you know, everybody can see the awesome things that you guys worked on. Like to go from being just a civilian of sorts <laughs> to a stand-up comedian in six weeks, you gotta, you gotta know, like one, that was just inside of you guys the entire time. The only thing that I did was show you how to bring it out. That's it. It's been inside of y'all the whole time. Lauren, you're a natural. When I first saw you performing, and I remember you say you did coaching, you know, business coaching, life coaching. And I was like, she is a natural. And I couldn't wait to see you on that stage. And your presence is just amazing. So the fact that, you know, you connect with audiences on so many different levels, that's amazing. You connect as, as a wife, as a mom, as a boss, as businesswoman, CEO status. You connect in so many realms and, and things. I got so much joy watching all of that come out of you. Wow. See, that's what coaching, you were coaching us. It's not telling people exactly what to do. First, say this, say this, say this. You were drawing out everybody's greatness. And that's why I got yes. choked up. It was like our fourth class. And I was sitting there. I was like, damn it, Don, like, fuck, I'm crying over here because you were inspiring all of us so much. Well, you know, and that's the thing. Comedy is one of these things that takes constant inspiration. I mean, normal everyday life takes constant inspiration as it is. Um, the kind of world we live in, this is a crazy world, as we've seen in the news, um, you know, evidence as the, you know, recent tragedies and, and things like that. This is a crazy world. Um, so literally, when I tell people I'm here to make you laugh, that's why I was put on this earth, to make you laugh. Because how can we deal with the tragedies, um, the things we don't want to become numb to it? We don't always want to walk around sad and, and just thinking about all the bad things. Well, comedians are here because we go through things too. But helping you laugh about what you're going through helps us feel better about what we're going through. And together we all laugh. We can all heal. We can all make this a better place. But to me, in my opinion, I'm a little bit jaded. It all starts with laughter. Laughter to me is the most pure feeling of joy that you can ever feel in your life. It's pure elation. Like when you're laughing, you're not thinking about anything else besides what it was that made you laugh at that moment. On my business card, I even have one right here. And it says, <laughs> laughter is an instant vacation. Oh my God. I love that. And it's laughter, true. It is because if you can forget what you've been going through, then I'm, by all means, let me be your travel agent. Let, let's just go for a little bit. Let's go for a few minutes and just laugh and forget about what's going on. Um, and, and just the interaction that I've had with people um, just, you know, in life. I'm talking about doing a show for, you know, uh, guys in the audience that he's only had three months, like, left to live. And he spent one of those nights with us. Oh, my God. This was, this was in Greensboro. This was back in, like, 2018 or so. And I had went and hosted for John Reap and uh, Brent Blakely at um, the Greensboro Comedy Zone. Had a guy in the audience, uh, I think it was at the first show, that said that um, the doctor had only gave him a few months to live. And I, it, it choked me up because I was like, you chose to spend one of your last nights on this earth hearing what we had to say. That's choking it me put, up too. Oh my God. It put everything into perspective then, Lauren. And since 2018... I have, have been on a different mission with this thing. I can feel that. That's why I'm so glad that the universe placed me in your class because this wasn't just the mechanics of comedy, which I kind of want to teach the listeners in a minute. This wasn't just about like how to do the setup and the punchline and the callback and the blah, blah, blah. Like, 
I could tell for you, it's something deeper because, because of the fact that you choose to teach Mm -hmm. and then the way you taught us to really like draw inspiration from your life. And when you were talking just now, it just occurred to me that laughter can be very healing. Yes. You know, and all of these crises, like we can go, I mean, you know, as of this recording, the the tragedy in Texas happened just two days ago. Right. And so Uh, it's so, I mean, how do you go on? And it's like, you have to find a way to heal and it's healthy to, it's not healthy to go down the rabbit hole. We live across the country. There's nothing we can do today. We can vote in November. Right. But like today we have to heal and be present and make today count. And I think that's Mm -hmm. what comedy can, can do for us. Right. Yes, yes, ma'am. That's what comedy can do because you you got to know. Um, for as much as the tragedy, you know, that happened. Um, I think it was uh, yesterday. Um, for as much as the tragedies that have happened over just in, uh, this past week or even these past few months or years or whatnot. Yeah. I guarantee you, on the days of those tragedies, there's a comedy show going on somewhere mm-hmm, mm-hmm. that night, and the audience is coming in with heavy minds and hearts because of what they witness. And so are the comedians, but comedians take a charge on their life that we want to make you laugh through it all. That's what we're here for. We're Mm -hmm. here to help you get your mind off of it. Yeah, we deal with it as well, but you know what? We can all laugh and we can deal together. And that's what, and that's what helps um, foster, you know, that healing togetherness. That's what it does. I mean, in my opinion, this country has been so divided over the yes. last, since its beginning anyway. But one thing about comedy, when we all come together under the guise of that stage, as you saw from your graduation show, everybody came to have a good time. Everybody came to laugh. And we were united under comedy, man. United under comedy. Amazing. If that oh my concept- God. If that concept could just reach this entire country, we'd be better off. But we were united under comedy. We came together. We laughed. We smiled. We hugged. We cheered. We 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 toasted. We had a great night, and that's the feeling that I would love to. That's the feeling that I want to give all audiences that I perform for. So we were united under comedy. Under comedy, everything is okay. I think you're right because looking at our class, the I'm just gonna say ten of us because I'm including you in this comedy troupe I want to I want to form so looking at the 10 of us we all are very different we were all at different walks of life backgrounds races ages like literally it spanned from like I think a 23 year old girl to a 60 some year old dude like people from all over the world literally I mean we have uh, Lucky who's from India like how did we all end up in one room in complete and total support of one another it's just under the, in, under the guise of comedy because we all have it in our hearts um, that, you know, we love to, to, to help people in some kind of way. Um, you know, you're a business and a life coach. So you essentially help people get, you know, things together so that way they can be um, super efficient on both the life and the business ends. Lucky um, said that he wanted to free people from captivity. Well, what do you mean from that? Capti- what do you mean about, you know, captivity, Lucky? captivity of your mind yes. the captivity of of just being you know a quote-unquote slave to other things such as like paychecks and fashion and you know money and things like that like freeing people through laughter that's how we all came together because we all have a common goal and a higher power put us all together because that love for that common goal resonates in all of us heavily and we were the perfect 10 people to get together to share that love with each other it, it was wild. I think it was divinely orchestrated. Okay. So I think there's probably people listening that are like, okay, I, if they're listening to this episode, they have the bug too. They're like, okay. Cause I, cause Don, ever since I got into this with you, I, there's probably been 10 to 15 people in my life that are like, I've always wanted to do that. Really? Yes. And it's the kind oh, of thing oh, that like oh. one person does it and then we're all talking about it. So let's say there's someone listening that has the bug, they like what we're talking about and they want to try stand-up comedy. Like, what do they need to know? Where would they start? Um, so there really are two places to start if you um, want to get into stand-up comedy. Um, some people go, of course, come to class. Um, and that way class is, is kind of like, um, it's kind of like going to college versus going straight into the business force. So you come to a class and stuff, you learn the ins and outs. Um, you learn, you know, pretty much the do's and the don'ts. Uh, we help each other write our sets and things. And at the end, you pretty much get a show out of it because, you know, you have a graduation show. So you have that time within the class to go and essentially do your jokes in front of a real audience to see how it will be. Um, so I would recommend that, of course. And then the second part, some people are just like, hey, I just want to go balls to the wall. That's mm-hmm. totally fine, too. 
started an open mic. We started an open mic. First, have some some thoughts, you know, have your material together, have your things that you want to talk about, because to just go to an open mic and just start riffing, especially not having <laughs> any comedy training, uh, you might not want to try comedy again after that. So um, I just recommend if you're going to go just the open mic route, have your like material prepared don't just go just talking all kinds of crazy shit because people gonna be like who the fuck is that right don't don't yeah just don't don't do that be prepared so either way if you want to start either a enroll in a class or b have some material prepared for that open mic so i would say start with the class it was incredible um these are some of the core pillars i feel like i learned from you and you can break some of these down so Class number one, I missed because I was in Myrtle Beach for spring break. However, I still took the class. I almost delayed the entire six week thing to another round. I'm glad I stayed in. I believe we talked about like picking up the mic, walking backwards, set it down and your intro. Yes, ma'am. And in class two, we went to an actual real life open mic night, which was so eye opening. And then the class after that was about the premise. And then class after that, it was like joke structure. And I, I, again, I missed a second class in there somewhere, but like when I came back from my second Miss class, everybody had set sort of structure and it included like premise, lead in, punchline, callback, like misdirection. So can you kind of break down like, okay, what is, what is a comedy set? Like what, what, how do you approach it? A comedy set is all of those things. um, And it's about the spin that you put on those things. Um, Essentially a comedy set is really your personality just being mixed in with the things that you want to talk about. Um, so, of course, we do have the mechanics, like you said, such as the taglines, the punch lines, the uh, callbacks, uh, premises. Um, the power you know, three, the power right? Three. That's right, things. power three. <laughs> we have, like, we have all of those things. And I feel that people, you know, they get kind of caught up on it because it's just like, hey, 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 you know, I, I got to follow this. So I got to follow that. Those are just the guidelines. You know, I liken this to kind of being, you know, like an athlete. You can be a natural, you know, you can be an athlete, have so much natural talent, but until you learn how to run the plays properly, once mm-hmm. you learn how to properly run the plays, then you can start to improvise. But you got to learn how those plays are ran at first. I'm so glad you said that because, all right, I'm going to tell you this. I'm sure you guessed it, but I am the only one of these nine classmates who blacked out and forgot my lines on stage. <laughs> it happens. You did a great oh. job. You did, yeah, I mean, you did a great you did a great job and it and this and it happens as comedian nobody's perfect I forget my lines all the time and I forget about what I want to talk about but being in it so long this is how remember how I just said you got to learn how to run the plays first yes so you run you learn how to run the plays so when I was first starting comedy I learned how to run the plays now almost five years later June 26th my anniversary woo, woo, woo. now Almost five years later, now that I know how to run the plays, I can improvise. So when I start to blank out and whatnot, there's something that's coming because it's been trained. You did an amazing job, Lauren. You made that crowd laugh. (laughs) Shout out to Mr. Widrick too, because he knew your set like the back of his hand. Thank God for Sean Daddy. Yeah. So (laughs) in all seriousness, like I cried a lot over that. No, don't, don't, do not, because you did an amazing job. You it did was great. fine, it was fine, but, like, I, I had, like, eight people come see me on a Sunday night, which for the mom crowd is, like, a big commitment to find a babysitter on a Sunday night before Monday. I yeah. ran off stage, bawled in the bathroom. Like, we went to the bar afterwards, and I looked like shit. Like, my whole face was, like, oh, a, a tire. Just, but, I'm no, this, the only reason, no, it's fine. The whole time, my husband was, like, it was fine. Nobody really noticed, and I'm, like, eh. However, this is what I want to tell people is like, this is part of the process of getting good at anything is being willing to suck a little bit at first. Yeah, you have to, you have to, I mean, how do you enjoy the, how do you enjoy the good without the bad? Um, You have to have some kind of reference. Um, I'll be honest. I had the biggest bomb of my career. uh, It was March 7th of 2018. I will never forget. (laughs) He's got the date memorized. (laughs) Yes, because that's how traumatized I was by it. What happened? Will it trigger you to talk about it? <laughs> so, uh, so all right. So, <laughs> in Charlotte, oh, you taking me down memory lane. Uh-oh. In Charlotte, 
Um, one of the OGs here, hilarious, but one of the best comedians that, in my opinion, I've ever seen on stage. His name is Tone X. And uh, Tone X shows a lot of love to the younger comics here. And he would host a uh, monthly show called Laugh It Up Thursday at Moorhead Tavern before it moved to Stats. And so I was tasked with, fe- it's the first time that I was featuring, 12 minutes, right? So naturally, I'm in my head. I'm like, I don't know what I'm going to do. I got to get my material together and stuff. So I was featuring for uh, comedian Marvin Hunter out of uh, Atlanta. First time featuring, like I said, 12 minutes. I performed on Laugh It Up Thursday three times before. Had not had any issues, right? But because I did something out of the ordinary, remember how I always tell you guys, if you're going to do a new joke, put it between two jokes that work. Yes, yeah. Sandwich it between the good stuff. (laughs) <laughs> mm-hmm. Well, essentially, Lauren, I I didn't I didn't I didn't trust my set at that time. I just was like, you know, it's a big opportunity. I got to wow them, and because I got outside of my head, I ended up dealing with the heckler who came on stage, and we proceeded to kind of like have a rose bottle. It was a debacle, like a total debacle, and it just ended up being something that it shouldn't have been. And me being young, and I felt so terrible. I bombed. I'm feeling like I let tone down. I, I, at the end of the night, he went to pay me my money. I was like, no, I don't want it. Mm. I don't want it. He was like, you came and did your time. I'm going to give you this money. I'm like, but I sucked. You are not going to give me that money. And that's when he did um, one of the best things, man, that ever happened for my career. You know, he pulled me to the side, man, and just, he just gave me that OG advice. He was like, man, look, I've been there, you know, yada, yada, been a young comic and whatnot. And essentially, you know, yeah, you have bad shows. It's going to happen. But it's not about what happened. It's about what do you do to fix it? Mm-hmm. How do you get better? What do you learn from that? Because honestly, nothing is a loss if you learn from it. There are no losses. There are only learning experiences. But it depends on do you actually take something away from that? And I did. And from that day, I've been a different comic. I've been a comic that's more confident in my set. Between then, I so I had that on, I think it was, yeah, it was March 7th. I had a show seven days later on the 14th (laughs) which is my next show and I was like you know what I was like it's make or break because I gotta correct that and since then I've just been approaching comedy a lot differently and I've had way more great sets than I than I have not and it was just all because I needed to get my face cracked early in the game I had to feel that I had to allow myself to bask in that I had to go home that night and not sleep you know um my boy, mm-hmm. Evan Piff, my boy, Evan Pitfield, who's a fellow comic in Charlotte, he told me down for 45 minutes. On the way home, he called me and we chatted for 45 minutes, man. And he basically taught me off the ledge. And honestly, I don't know where I'd be without that conversation with Evan. So I will forever be indebted to him for that, for just hearing me out because it sucked. And mm-hmm. I went straight to Facebook and I told Facebook about it. I was like, I want to let y'all know. I stunk it up and I, because I'm honest about that, you know, <laughs> there, there are going to be comedians that tell you they kill all the time, but I'm not one of those guys. So that was my biggest bomb. Did I learn from it? Yes. Uh, okay. You read my mind. Cause that was going to be my question. How often do you or the average, like, you know, comedian, how often do you bomb? Because I've read these comedian biographies and they're like, like Ali Wong, I've read her book. And she was like, I bombed for like eight fucking years, which I don't totally believe, but like, I've heard that there's more bombing than success to really get to the gold. Is that true or not really? Yeah, it's definitely true. Um, it's definitely true. You got to bomb because like I said, you have to feel that you have to bask in it. You have to, you, you have to allow yourself. I mean, to be honest, I'd much rather had bombed at that moment in my career mm-hmm. than to have been a 25 year vet and on the stage in Madison square garden and that be a bomb that would have been devastating, but you have yep. to learn you got to learn how to deal with it. You have to learn how to feel. You got to learn how to essentially look at yourself and say, okay, what can I do better? You know, because it's not yeah. always the crowd. It's not always whoever other factors. Sometimes it's you as the comic. You have to learn, how, read the room, adapt to it. Once you adapt to that room, you'll learn how those jokes need to be presented and things like that. But then again, it's all a learning process. So I don't want a career where I don't bomb. I've, you know, I've bombed before and stuff like that. I will say now, I definitely (laughs) don't bomb nearly as much now, thank God. But I still have those nights where I don't feel like it's my night. And that's, those are the nights that keep me going. Mm. Those nights. 
it's those nights where I feel like I've hosted or I've done a set or I've done something, but I don't, I didn't get the, the normal reaction that I'm, I'm used to getting. And to me, I'm just like, okay, cool. Game, set, match. That's a way for me to stay good and for me to stay challenging myself. I don't want it to always be good because it's not, but those bad nights are always going to resonate in my mind more than the good ones. It reminds me of an athlete's mindset, which I don't know anything about sports ball. So <laughs> bear with me while I say this, but it kind of feels like Tom Brady watching game tape. So like, yeah, I did good. I even won the game, but like that, that one pass was off or like, I didn't mm -hmm. run fast enough. If you have that athlete's mindset of like, I don't learn from the wins. I learn from the missteps. Yep. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Because I always, anytime I get off stage and say, if one of my OGs is watching, I always want to know what could I have done better? Don't tell me what I did good. Don't tell yeah. me what I'm doing good. Tell me where to pick my game up. Tell me where I'm lacking. What did I do that was off? Was I not holding the mic right? Did I not keep enough eye contact? Did I not split into the A, B, and C portions of the room? Like, what was it that, you know, I did that I can do better? And they'll tell me, and then I'll apply it. I don't want to know what I did good. I don't want people, oh, you're the best, you're done. I don't want that. I want to work for this. I want to grind. I want to go hard. And I want to prove myself on that stage every single night. Mm -hmm. And I am so thankful and grateful for the honest people in my life that will say, hey, you could have turned it up a little bit. Thank you for that. I needed that. Our class did that for another, like one another yep, yep. during mm -hmm. the six weeks. It was done with such love and actual like genuine support. But we were like, cut that joke. <laughs> You know what yeah, I mean? Oh yeah. Oh or yeah. Like, for sure. Try this and like, you know, cut the fat, get to the funny fat. What do you say? Get to the funny faster. Yeah, get to, yep. Mm -hmm. Get to the funny faster. And we were honest with each other. And I think it did improve everybody's set. It definitely did. Um, and that inspired, tr um, that inspired trust amongst the set as well. Um, because you guys weren't just fluffing each other. If it was good, you would laugh and say, oh man, that was good. If it wasn't, you said, oh, you might want to you might want to cut that joke. And you guys impressed me because to essentially go from being strangers to as close as you guys were as, as, as fast as possible, um, as fast as, as it was in the class and to just have that comfort level where you can tell somebody, Hey, you might want to just chop that, you know, or you might want to refine that or whatnot. That takes a lot, but I'm glad you guys held each other accountable. That's important. Accountability and comedy is probably one of the biggest things besides professionalism and being actually funny. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it's been amazing. So we're all on a text thread now. We've been texting for days, like <laughs> lining up our next open mic night. I know I'm like, fuck these open mic nights. I'm going to do our own comedy production <laughs> event. Like we're going to, the nine of us are going to headline our own events and we're going to sell Let's tickets. Do it. <laughs> Let's do it. Let's do it. And I will help in any way that I can with that. Let's do it. I, I would love to. Would love to. Um, I did. Uh, I think I talked to Max earlier. Um, and I know you guys are looking for open mics next week. And I did say, um, let me know where and when I will be there. See, that's what it's like to have real support in your goals. Okay. So I want to talk to you about, I guess, authenticity is one way to say it. Letting your freak flag out. So uh -huh. you guys, I am going to attach audio of my set to this podcast so you can hear it. The blacked out forgetting of the lines and all. I don't want, I, I want to edit that part out, but I'm not going to. So you guys can hear it. But the premise of my show is that I have a big hoe demon inside of me and I'm just trapped <laughs> in the body of a housewife. And I just want to like hoe around town all the time, but I got to like drive around in my minivan. So that was my premise. And for me, that was letting my, well, my listeners of this podcast know I'm a big fat hoe basically, but. <laughs> if you're ready for your next graduate, say yeah, done. Yeah. This next hilarious young lady drives a minivan in the streets. But she says she a freak in the sheets. Y'all give it up for Miss Lauren Wintry. How is everybody doing? Oh, everybody's so amazing. I love it. And I never learned how to walk backwards with the mic. So we'll do this real quick. Can I make a confession? I was so nervous about tonight that I taped maxi pads to my armpits to prevent myself from sweating through. <laughs> it's kind of like bringing a knife to a gunfight because the shit is soaked. So it's a good mom hat if you need one. Oh my gosh, it's so amazing to be here. Some of my friends are here tonight. Thank you guys for coming on a Sunday night. And they asked me, what inspired you to, you know, dip your toe into stand-up comedy? And my honest answer was, I'm just a big hoe. Trapped in the body of a housewife, and I have no safe outlet for my hoe bag tendencies and degenerate thoughts. So you guys are the lucky recipients tonight. So what I can say to that is, you're welcome. 
That song is from a Disney movie, and if you don't know it, then fuck you, because you haven't had to watch Moana a hundred times like I have. <laughs> no, I really do feel caught between two worlds. I'm 39, I'm about to turn 40, and that means I'm too old to twerk and dress like a streetwalker, but I'm too young to give it up. Yeah. Obviously. <laughs> But it does cause some weird dress code dilemmas in my house. I'll be getting dressed and look at my husband and be like, these nipple pasties, too much for the PTA meeting or what? <laughs> Never. Never? <laughs> yeah, we like them? <laughs> Thank you, my husband stepped in my, when I blacked out on my joke. Okay. <laughs> You're coming to all my shows now, honey. <laughs> No, but one area of life that I have leaned into this mom stuff is my car. So I do drive a minivan, also known as my MILF mobile. <laughs> yes, I love it. Yes. I love my minivan. Um, gosh, what else about minivans? Honey, help me out. <laughs> Honey, help me out. Oh, yes, here's what it is. Okay, so love my minivan. I embrace it, but there are so many moms in my neighborhood, the soccer moms that are like, I could never. I could literally never become a minivan mom. And I'm like, okay, Becky, the minivan's the thing that's gonna make you uncool? Got it. <laughs> right? <laughs> Honey, help me out again. <laughs> what was that? Party. We have a party in it. Oh, yeah, we do have a party in it. Okay. So I love my minivan, but that shit gets messy. So we've got kids in the back, there's shit everywhere. And it reminds me of a joke that my friend Greg told me one time, which is that you can tell a lot about a woman by the way she keeps her car because the way she keeps her car is the way she keeps her lady garden, <laughs> right? And when I heard that joke, I was like, well, first of all, Greg didn't say lady garden. He used a very different word. <laughs> but when I heard that joke, I first thought, uh-oh, <laughs> because I was doing some self-reflection because one time I found a banana in my back seat that was so old and gross and had become a mummy. And so I was like, yeah, you. <laughs> then I thought more about Greg's analogy. I'm like, no, that stands. Like sometimes we give ourselves the full, you know, detail treatment. Like when you go to Autobell, right? You wash it down with soap. They get the undercarriage, right? They clean the carpet, maybe some wax, right? There's a bunch of cute college kids patting it down with a chamois, right? So there's a fragrance. So I'm like, yeah, the joke stands. But then I'm like, other times you've got to get up in there with a hose and a shot back. <laughs> but it's not always such an emergency. You know how when you go through the gas station and you fill up and you just like squeegee the windshield? I got a move for that too. It's called the baby wipe and blow dry and you're on your way. <laughs> Remember that PTA meeting I was talking about with the nipple pasties? Yeah, you and that baby wipe can have your own PTA meeting. Get the pits, tits, and ass and you've covered the whole enchilada. <laughs> No, the minivan, I really do feel caught between two worlds, like when I'm picking up my kids from school, and I'm listening to Cardi B. Who here listens to Cardi B? <laughs> right? My favorite song is WAP. We know the song Wet Ass Pussy. Yes? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we do. Yeah, we do. <laughs> so, I'm sitting in the car line, and I'm jamming out the van. I'm like, what are you fucking with some wet ass Patricia? Hey, girl. How was Ellie's dance recital? <laughs> Yeah, at least not allowed to play at our house anymore. <laughs> I will say this. I think the number one place my hoe tendencies tend to creep out is in bed with my husband. But man, housewife shit keeps getting in the way, right? So for instance, our kids love to sleep in our bed, which is so sweet, but such a cock block. It's fine, it's fine, we let them do it. So we tuck them in, they fall asleep, and then we scurry upstairs because the second best mattress in the house is actually my five-year-old's frozen bed. <laughs> It's the one with this like big giant Olaf on it. So not the sexiest place, but at this point I'll fuck on anything so it really doesn't matter. So we tuck him in and much like a Disney movie, the path to the promised land is littered with obstacles. So we're stepping on Barbie heads, injuring our feet, having to knock down the fort that the kids built. But oh my God, we get there and we get to the business. But I will say this, 100% of the time I find myself face down, ass up, having a threesome with Olaf. <laughs> You and your snow have got to go. I'm in my flow. I'm trying to hoe, you motherfucker. <laughs> Literally. <laughs> now the truth is, if it was Elsa on the bed, that might be a different story. <laughs> no, I mean, it, 
the most fucked up part is that it's just getting really inconvenient because I'm like Pavlov's dog now. Anytime I see something related to a Disney movie, I have to change my underwear. <laughs> That's it. Thank you guys. One more time for Lauren Wintry. All right, I just got this crazy urge to watch Frozen when I get home. <laughs> <laughs> so, Mr. Widrick, if you got Disney Plus, I need your password. Uh -huh. <laughs> One more time for Lauren Widrick, y'all. I think comedy can be about like authenticity, but I've always wondered where to draw the line because there are topics that are sensitive, controversial, maybe even divisive, right? But also those topics are really funny. Yeah, so yeah. what is your take on like some of the like in, infusing controversial topics into your comedy? Um, you got to have a certain skill set to do that, um, of course. And I mean, as I told you guys, anything that's funny is not offensive. It's not offensive as long as you can make it funny. Um, mm -hmm. Because I mean, think about it. Sometimes, you know, we have to crack jokes about things um, to feel better about it. You know, I have a comedian friend that um, unfortunately, you know, uh, he lost his mom last year. Uh, rest in peace. And um, about a week later, he was, you know, doing jokes about it. And, you know, there were people that were like, oh, my gosh, you know, how can you, you know, da, 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 too soon. And in my mind, I'm like, well, it was his mom. How can you tell him it was too soon? And then, two, how do you know that this is not some kind of healing or therapy for him? We don't know what he's going through. He right. just lost his mom. And this may be making him feel kind of better or feel like she's still around. We don't know. So with that being said, I don't feel like any topic is off limits. If you can make it funny, then go for it. There's been, of course, comedians that, you know, make jokes about politics and things and religion and, you know, even um, events such as like 9-11 or something like that. If it's funny, it's going to fly. And yeah. that's anywhere. The problem is, the problem is there are comedians and I say that loosely um comedians out here that take these topics and feel like they can just say whatever they want to about them and oh you should laugh at it no you just don't have the skill set to put that spin on it right once you put a spin once you put a spin on things it changes it because it changes the direction of it it takes the malice out of that joke it takes the sadness out of that 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 um topic or whatever it takes whatever bad things and makes it funny and if we can't laugh about things on a comedy stage, then where can we laugh about it at? Yeah, I think that's beautifully said. And I think comedy you taught me is, is nuanced as well. Mm -hmm. So like, you're not, a, you're not afraid of like controversial or racy topics, right? Like a couple of us had race. I probably had like maybe the most racy. I was talking about having like a face down ass up threesome with Olaf on my daughter's bed. <laughs> I, I, watched, I watched Frozen three <laughs> times that night. <laughs> oh my God, right? Um, but you taught me and a couple of my classmates about the power of not saying the dirty word. Like one of my jokes originally just straight up had the word pussy in it. And then we were like, maybe don't say that. Maybe like slow down, point at it. Like, ha -ha. like, and we did that with another one. There was like a gay sex joke. We were like, instead of just talking about like ass pounding, like maybe just allude to it with a gesture. And it was funnier. Mm -hmm. It was funnier it that way. So nuance is important too. Oh, definitely. So, um, and honestly, people are always going to laugh at where their mind goes. The imagination yeah. is, the imagination is a great thing. And on, while we're on stage, when we're acting out, uh, you know, our sets and things like that, when we're pretty much, uh, giving, you know, our sets to the audience, um, and we're pretty much playing characters and things like that, we're, we're tapping into their imagination. And so, you know, when you stop short of saying a certain word or, you know, you mm -hmm. just do a gesture or an innuendo, as opposed <laughs> to saying the actual word, it, it's a lot funnier like that. It can't people be. laugh. Exactly. People laugh because their imagination, they're like, oh, you did what I knew you were going to do, but you did it differently. Oh, that's funny. <laughs> and then the opposite, because we had a couple people in our class that were very sweet. Mm -hmm. And then when they dropped, which we didn't expect it, when they dropped the like fucking St. Bernard joke, do you remember? We were like, oh shit, oh, she man. just said that from her. Yeah. It was very unexpected. Yep. And that's why I told you, that's why I was saying you guys can get away with so much on stage. You all had a different aspect of likability um, on the stage. Mm -hmm. Of course, with, of course, with the ladies and things like that. One thing about ladies, I respect ladies in comedy so much um, because there aren't that many of them. And there are there are a few less that are actually, you know, like top tier 
you know, headliner status and things like that, which, you know, having you, Kanika, uh, Mikey and Max in the class, um, that just, I felt great because one thing here in Charlotte, I know that we definitely need a lot of is lady comedians. Yeah, I know that. So it did, it really made my heart feel good to see that you all had enrolled in class, stuck through, and now, you know, starting um, your comedy journeys. But those different aspects of likability definitely, definitely, definitely can help you get away with murder. Um, <laughs> <laughs> can definitely help you get away with murder. Like, for instance, Lauren, you know, with your set, of course, talking about, you know, being a house mom and a life coach and a business coach. And of course, with all the, you know, um, hilarious things that are in your set you can literally stand on that stage and even if you had said the p word they would have laughed hard because you have a high level of likability you get on that stage automatically you're bubbly you're open you're not afraid of the crowd and i mean to be honest you know um when you're you know a good looking person that helps as well so you have all those things that draws the audience in that they were like hey i want to see what she's talking about because half of them are just like oh i know what she's going to talk about but then the other half are just like, oh, I want to hear what she's going to talk about. It works out very well. And when you have that, you're using that power to, to your advantage. It's a wonderful thing. You can literally get away with murder on that stage all because of your level of likability. And you can't teach mm -hmm. like It's natural. Every damn person in our class had it. Like when we mm -hmm. went to that open mic night, I don't know, four weeks prior, I remember, I remember loving that night because I'm like half these people I felt drawn that not our class but the people we were watching oh yeah yeah half of them I was like damn these are people are funny and the other half I'm like oh man I got nothing like I'm not into these people and I have to imagine likability is different for everybody so here's an example I had been telling Sean about two or three of our classmates that I find to be like these three people are like so hilarious and so he was so excited for their set and he agreed they killed it however he actually loved these three people as his favorite yep. and I was like huh I wouldn't have expected that. We like really are drawn to different comedy styles and they, mm -hmm. all of our classmates killed it equally. Just people are drawn to different vibes. Oh, definitely. So people are drawn to different vibes. There is the, you know, eccentric vibe where you're just all over the place. There's a laid back vibe where you're more mm -hmm. cool and things like that. Um, there, you know, some people have kind of like that, that monotone vibe where it's just kind of like a deadpan, you know, just whatever staring your face and just, I'm just going to say it how it comes out. And that's hilarious. There are so many different styles of comedy. And as I was telling you guys, audiences decide in the first 10 to 15 seconds whether or not they like you. Mm -hmm. You guys saw that, you guys saw that at the open mic because there were comedians that came in and boom, just attacked off the bat. And the audience loved that. You also had comics that waited until about a minute, minute and a half to try and get to the funny stuff. And uh, well, when it doesn't land, it just makes the rest of your set kind of unbearable. So Everything that I said to you guys in class, definitely true. You saw it in motion at the mic and things. Um, but, you know, you guys came out firing at graduation. I mean, everybody within the first within the first 10 to 15 seconds had their first jokes off. And um, like I said, that just that different, those levels of likability, it, it, it helped out even more. So, I mean, like I said, you guys don't know like what, what you did. And that email I sent you earlier, I said, I'm still riding the high from graduation. Aww. I hope you are too. I am still riding that high, like super proud of you all. God, it's so good. It's so good, Dawn. We're so grateful. It okay, only gets better. You. Really? Yeah, it only gets better. You just work <sighs> at it and it's not going to always be good, but it, it only gets better from here. So I, I can promise you that. I really hope this inspires people who have a goal in the back of their mind. That's like, I've always wanted to take a cooking class or I've always wanted to do comedy or I've always wanted to start a business. To listen to Don and I being like, just fucking start, like yep, just yep, start, get support, get a trainer, get a squad of people who can help you through it. And like, you know, it's okay if you suck. My first performance, I would give myself like a three or four out of 10. I was like, so I know Don's rolling his eyes. It was fine. You know, I watched it back a couple hours ago for the first time and was like, it wasn't as bad as I thought. See, you know see, what I mean? Y'all will hear it. I'm attaching the audio, those black, those blank outs on stage with those lights. I was just like, my heart like went into my gut and was like, God damn it. However, watching it back, I'm like, okay, cool. That was more like maybe a six or eight out of 10. Fine. I'm gonna go again. Like I'm going to do this again. Yeah, thank you. Yes. Okay. Don, I have two more questions for you. Tell us some, like one or two of your best jokes that just slay the audience every time. Like but you can tell the joke or just the premise of the joke, but like what, what always like slays for you? 
Um, with always slays. Um, one, I, I have a joke about having man boobs. Um, because I actually, <laughs> because I actually do have them, and it's real life, and it's something that I deal with every day. And I choose to turn what could be a bad situation into a good one. And so, you know, I just tell jokes about having them and how I discovered I had them and things and what do I do with them now and, you know, and then things like that. And I think it helps as well because, um, you know, with comedy, I like to inspire as well. So not only is the joke funny, but um, it's also pretty much inspiring, you know, other, uh, say, guys that may be in my position saying, hey, bro, embrace your body, love yourself positive body positivity don't let nobody mm. no not let nobody call them titties or nothing like that they are testicles all right chest decorations so you <laughs> you feel very empowered by those okay like that's what I that's you know that's pretty much like my goal and things uh when I tell that joke for for different um guys and things and um and the audience and I always meet one after the show they're like oh man like oh that's hilarious man like I deal with that too well, thanks. We just connected on a different level. Yeah. Now oh it's, pa it's past the jokes. You made that, or at least some version of that joke at graduation on Sunday. And Sean, my husband, literally, he he laughs a lot, but I've never seen him laugh like that. He was literally like, <laughs> I, we're I'm, talking about like a girl got to second base with you. And at that oh, yeah, was yeah. so funny. <laughs> I was in college. I was in college when I discovered I had this magical power, man. So like, I'm, when I'm on stage, I'm telling real life stuff. Like that's real. That's real. I love that joke. I love that joke. Do you have like maybe one more in your back yeah, pocket? Yeah. Oh yeah, for sure. So there's a joke that I always tell in Charlotte, um, especially, you know, about the street names here, um, because the street names, they, they really, they don't always sell their advertising. And then I'm like Sugar Creek and people laugh because Sugar Creek is historically hood. And I'm like, sugar cream. I'm like, ain't no sweet over there. So <laughs> uh -huh. I go down a list of like five street names in Charlotte um, that, you know, I their names, you know, and, and uh, the things that come with them are totally opposite. You know, like I, I say, yeah, exactly. Like I say, I don't even, I don't drive down Wilkinson no more because that sounds like we'll kill something, which it does. <laughs> and <laughs> which it does. And something probably would happen over there. So, you know, yeah. just that, just that realness in the joke and just being honest about it and just you know hearing people saying oh man I passed by sunset the other day and I thought about your joke and cracked up that means the world to me I think one of your jokes has Moorhead oh, it, it does, does. that's why <laughs> is it Boulevard or Street Moorhead Boulevard I forget what it is but there's a street in Charlotte called Moorhead and I'm sure there's yeah. jokes abound abounding oh yeah it's Moorhead Street and it's just like you know whoever named it was just standing on that street one day it was just like man you know I I done got more head on this street than any other street in this city. That's how that's how we gonna name this one, more head. Like, yeah, that's is I that's how I figure it happened. So that's funny. my imagination. Oh my god! And like, I know I've heard like you allude to some of these jokes, but one of the best things you do is I've seen you host now twice, and you think on your feet. Like, this is another skill you hone because after someone does a set, you can come up and like make a joke about their set. And it's so funny and it's so like it connects the two performers together oh yeah for sure that's one of the best things that I love about hosting hosting I'm a little bit more loose and I can just you know pretty much yeah. uh you know go off the go full Rambo with you know whatever I want to do on that stage and things but um the one thing that I love to do is big up performers uh so when you're done with your set I love to you know make some kind of joke in reference to something in your set to make that audience remember that you know make them yeah. remember that and make them remember you as a performer because you already did make them remember you from being, you know, just an awesome performer. But it's my goal as the host to really embed that in that mind and be like, hey, y'all give it up one more time for Lauren Widrick. This is like, you know, because some people are like, what's her name? What's her name? Lauren Widrick. Oh, yeah, let's go find. And then they think about those jokes and then they associate those jokes with the comedians. And then now you got fans that come up and like, oh, my, I'm still laughing about that frozen joke. <laughs> <laughs> it, this is it's a domino effect this is how it happens this is how we build fan bases oh okay I'm not joking about the comedy troupe I've said it like six times I'm for real I'm gonna book us a venue I'm gonna put like a flyer with all eight all eight or ten of our faces and we're just gonna sell tickets and let's I don't know start. get famous me, I don't know what's gonna happen from it I don't really care it's for the pleasure and the joy honestly let's do let's do it anything I can do to help I'm there let's do it well you'll definitely be the host and maybe you can like end the show what do they call that like the closer you know yeah yeah I can do that that's no problem at all you no can problem. do that 
Okay. So this is my final question for you. Okay. What is your dream? What is your big goal? Like state it to us, state it to the universe so that we can support you. But like, if ever, if all your dreams came true, what would happen? To be honest, um, my biggest, my biggest dream in this whole stand up thing is just honestly, and you're going to think I'm being funny when I say this, my, my biggest goal is to just help others um, that want to love this, that want to pursue this, that want to give this a shot others that may have been doubting themselves, others that may have been putting this on the back burner. My goal is to help, my dream is to help all those people, you know, get started and mm. at least, you know, get started and find some kind of ground into where they can start to build their foundation. I like to be the guy on the back end that that's making calls and making text messages and things like that. And other people don't know that I'm working on their behalf and they didn't ask me to, but I am because I have a high belief in them. And I built a platform for myself. Um, I built connections. Why would I keep all that to myself when I can use that to help others to really get to where they want to be in this or to help, you know, start that dream? As a class, I didn't have anybody to do that for me. My first open mic, I walked in, Lauren, and everybody looked at me as if I didn't belong because I was one of the new guys. And at that time, you know, they weren't really... Um, to you know they weren't really too into embracing us and I said from that day I will never ever make anybody feel unwelcome in this comedy game wow and that is my goal everybody that comes through I'm showing love you know classes no classes whatever if this is what you really want to do and this is where your heart is at I'm here 110 percent to help out I know that feeling to know that you know people looking at you as if you don't belong or you're not supposed to be here. I'm going to tell you the honest truth. And this is no lie. And this is not me, you know, flexing as the kids say or anything like that. Everybody that look at me crazy in that room are either not performing or they can't hold a candle to your boy no more. Yep. Yep. So while I'm out doing 30 and 45s and stuff, they still doing fives at open mics. Mm -hmm. All I'm saying is patience, persistence, progress, dedication, just be genuine. That's my goal because I know what hard work and dedication has done for me. So I know what it'll help do for others as well. So you and I share this in common because I like to call myself a goal activator. Like oh, I'm just a girl nice. that like goes, that. holy shit, you can do it. I may not even have all the answers of the coaching for you. Come to me and it'll go from idea to reality. That's what you did for us. That's what you do for brand new comedians is like, You've always dreamed of it, always wanted to do it. And now there's a space to make it real and the most exactly. loving, supportive space. So, okay. If you ever want to start the Don Garrett uh, Comedy Academy, I'll be your first investor. Thank I you. will Thank send you everybody because like, if you've had this in your heart, like what do you have to lose by taking a six week class? You have nothing to lose nothing. at all. You know, you have, you have more to lose by not doing it because uh, to be, to be honest, I'd rather live my life with you know, the fact that I tried and maybe didn't succeed as opposed to not trying at all and always wondering what if I will never live my life on my knees ever. Mm -hmm. And this is why I was like, I couldn't help it. I pulled Don aside and was like, you need to be a life coach. Comedy is your tool set, but like you're actually inspiring people to be authentic and dig deep and heal and share gifts and connect with one another. Like what you've done goes beyond comedy. Well, thank you. And I mean, honestly, these relationships go past comedy. Like Y'all are stuck mm -hmm. with me now. You know, this is not yeah. a hey, teacher, student, late night. We're friends now. And, you know, we're friends. You all have my number, my email. I'm still here, regardless of whether or not you're in class. I'm still here. That doesn't stop. And I wanted to make that, you know, very known. You know, people think, oh, we out of class. He forgets. Not, no, I don't care how busy my schedule is. I don't care how many classes I have and whatnot. If you send me a text or a call and say, hey, I need you real quick. I'm putting down whatever I've got going on and we're chatting. So that's how that goes. And comedy, I've had the, oh man, such the honor and pleasure of just meeting, you know, great individuals, so many genuine individuals that I now have the pleasure to call friends. And mm -hmm. friendship is a word that I take very seriously. And it just, it, it just means a lot to me because you guys don't even have to do that. You don't have to entertain me. You don't have to talk to me or nothing like that. But the fact that, you think enough of me to say, hey, you know what? I don't want to try being this guy's friend or taking this guy's class or learning from this guy or performing with this guy. It means a lot to you, boy. So thank y'all. God, it was amazing.
Okay. So I want everybody to start following you on Instagram and you have more classes coming up. So if you're in the Charlotte area, Don, tell us how people can follow you and then take the journey that I did with you. Yes, ma'am. Um, so you can find me on uh, Instagram and Facebook at Don Garrett Comedy. Um, also, DLGcomedy.com. Um, and as far as a comprehensive list of the classes, um, those can be found on the Charlotte Comedy Theater Instagram at Charlotte Comedy Theater. Our next um, class starts June 6th. Okay, so as of this recording, it will be in like a week or two, I think, a couple weeks after. So if you are interested, take this as the sign from the universe. If you're in the Charlotte area, like jump into Dawn's class. Do not hesitate because even if you never find yourself on Netflix special, you will get an immense amount of life skills and a a connection and a friend in Dawn by doing it. So reach out to him. And also let's follow his Instagram so we can go support him at his shows as well. Well, thank y'all so much. I really appreciate that. And I mean, y'all got to let me know when y'all perform it too so I can come out. I definitely want to come see y'all kill stages and stuff, man. Um, but, you know, Lauren, what, what you're doing, man, just the, the the life coaching, the business coaching, and, um, you know, even embarking in the comedy, it's, it's evident. You have a passion for people and you have a God-given talent to connect with others on multiple levels mm-hmm. um, to just help them, you know, succeed or heal or whatever, man. So you are literally a godsend. So keep up what you're doing you guys support lauren uh grab life by the goals man everything that she does like you're legit a god sent for a lot of people so keep keep it up please we need you i feel the same about you all all nine of us do so all right guys i will leave you on these high vibes hopefully we'll leave you laughing on this episode go follow don and everybody grab life by the goals and we'll see you next time bye Thank you so much for listening to the Grab Life by the Goals podcast. If you loved this episode, I would be thrilled if you subscribed wherever you listen to your podcast so that you can get notified when an episode drops and we can rendezvous like this every single week. If you're feeling frisky, maybe slap a five-star review on this bitch and maybe even some comments about what inspired you from this podcast episode. This is simply so more people can find us and join our squad of badassery. I love me some Instagram, so come find me. My handle is at Lauren Widrick, and if you screenshot and share this episode with your peeps, I'll come shower you with all the virtual hugs and kisses. Until next time, grab life by the goals, my friend.